I'd like to call the social services subcommittee to order. <clears throat> Any declarations of pecuniary interest? Seeing none. Sorry, I have to switch back and forth between my screens. Um, we have no delegation scheduled. So number four is report of the manager of children's services. Information on workforce funding for child care in early years. The staff recommendation is that the report entitled information on workforce funding for child care in early years be received for information. And uh, so you can go ahead and talk on that, please. Uh, for the chair, if I could just interrupt, uh, is it possible to receive a motion uh, to receive the addendum that was circulated previously? Oh, of course. To consider item four. Thank you. Um, uh, Councillor Ritzma and Councillor Burback is seconding it. All in favor? Carry. And through that the chair was for the only, motion. Yeah, and the through the chair, only a mover is required. Oh, okay. I always forget that. Thank you very much. So helpful. <laughs> Um, okay, so Kim, who would like to speak on this? Uh, thank you. I'll, I'll quickly introduce our new children's services manager, okay. and this is Darren Barkhouse. He's this is his first report he'll be delivering to social services subcommittee. Uh, Darren commenced his duties as children's services manager uh, or, uh, towards the end of last year. Um, some may recognize him as the previous early on coordinator through the corporation, and he is now uh, our manager of children's services. So, Darren, I'll get to you to speak to your report. Thank you. Thanks, Kim. Uh, and through the chair. So this report has been uh, submitted just for your information pertaining to the workforce funding agreement implemented by the federal government. So it's totaling approximately 150 million province wide with our location or our allocation, sorry, sitting at 450,000 for the year 2022. It's a one-time targeted funding designed to help support the recruitment and retention for qualified uh, registered early childhood educators or RECEs in the child care and early years field. So some initiatives involved through professional learning opportunities, marketing strategies, strengthening relationships with our community partners, technological upgrades in our classrooms and additional staffing support. So we hope this is gonna help start us along that path to long-term uh, recruitment and retention. Currently, we're sitting approximately 80 full-time RECE short across um, the whole county um, with regards to Child Care and Early Years Program. So we're optimistic that uh, a long-term strategy will be implemented soon by the province and the federal government. Thank you. Thank you. Very good. Um, does anybody have any questions or comments? No? Okay, so then I'm looking for a mover for the report. Councilor Bacalakis, and um, there's no other comments or anything or questions. All in favor? Thank you. So now we'll move on to what I, I'm happy to see that we have around 19 people coming in to hear about the homeless enumeration results, I'm sure, because it's a very passionate thing. Now, we don't normally do this, but I would like to say, uh, I'll ask the city clerk, is it possible for the people that are just watching to be able to ask a question? Is there a chat box for them? Do you know? Uh, through the chair, uh, no, not with this setup. There is not a chat box. However, if the subcommittee wanted to make a motion to hear a member of the public, uh, we could certainly enable them to talk. Uh, it would be subject to them having the proper uh, equipment in order to speak in the meeting. And how would we know if they want to ask a question? Uh, through the chair, it's my understanding uh, attendees have the ability to raise their hand. Okay. And perfect. that would signal that they're interested in speaking potentially, unless they've accidentally hit that button as well. <laughs> yeah, that happens lots of times, right? So I just want everybody to be aware of that, that um, if some people raise their hand after they hear the report, they have a question. Um, we can look at that as a, as a subcommittee because I think it's important that, well, it's a very important subject. We all know that. So anyway, um, just a minute while I read that. So 5.1 is the staff recommendation that the report titled 2021 Homelessness Enumeration Results be received for information. And um, Kim, who would like to speak to this? 
Thank you, through the chair. I'm gonna have Alex Burgess, our manager of Ontario Works and Homelessness, speak to the results of this year's and their variation. Thank you. Go ahead, Alex. Good afternoon, councillors. Uh, through the chair, uh, we, as you'll see, there is the addendum that was also attached, which has uh, a bit of a snapshot on the homelessness enumeration that was completed. So as we reviewed on report uh, SOC 21010 back in September, uh, that we were going to be conducting an enumeration. It was a ministry mandated enumeration this year. Uh, we have had a quality by name list through our Built for Zero Canada collaborative since October of 2019. So we've actively been collecting this data and keeping up to date on it and using the by name list to inform the decisions that the department makes uh, with regards to supporting individuals experiencing homelessness since the onset of the quality by name list that we had uh, in October of 2019. So with that, the enumeration was completed. Uh, on October uh, 30th was the night that we used for the point in time count. So the methodology that was used uh, for this enumeration was mandated to us by the ministry. So it was made quite clear that we had to use a single night uh, as a snapshot for the homelessness uh, situation that is, that is ongoing in the community. Uh, and we use November 1st to 10th, which coincides with our by name list updates that we complete monthly. Uh, the agencies that conducted the surveys were listed in the report that was uh, put forth in September. Uh, there was, I believe, 10 agencies or close to including ourselves uh, who were part of the uh, enumeration that was completed. Uh, it was done across the county as well. I just want to remind of that, that the numbers that we're discussing today uh, encapsulate across our service manager catchment area, which is Stratford, Perth County and St. Mary's. Uh, so a lot of the data that we have gone over is covered in the report. Uh, as of the time the report was written, the most up-to-date by name list data we had was 164 individuals and families experiencing homelessness on our local by name list. Uh, and some of the information I'll go over, I'll just kind of cover what was uh, put forth in the, the addendum that was circulated. So you will saw the current living situation. There was 63% were provisionally accommodated of the individuals that were surveyed of the 118 surveys that were completed. Uh, 31 were uh, in emergency shelter of some form and 11%. Uh, so th about 13 households run sheltered at that period of time. Uh, and again, the 118 surveys were only the survey respondents that we were able to reach during that 10 day period. Uh, we do, as I said, the number was closer to 164 families experiencing homelessness. Uh, our by name list with the fact that we have that data available to us was able to speak to that and ensure that even though we weren't able to reach everyone to complete a survey, we do have that up to date number and those families are captured on our by name list to ensure they are prioritized for services uh, when services do become available. Um, so really just there's high level, uh, just want to go through just kind of those, what stood out in that, that 69% of the household surveyed were experiencing chronic homelessness at that time. Uh, the average age that we saw was 38. Uh, I think some of the important things I, I wanted to touch on quickly was in regards to uh, the risk factors that we saw. Uh, so about a third of the individuals we surveyed had some form of illness or medical condition. A third had some form of physical limitation. Uh, just under half had a learning or cognitive limitation. Uh, and I think the staggering number that we saw was 86% of survey respondents did re uh, self-report that there was a mental health issue and over half had identified substance use issues as well. Um, we see that the reasons for homelessness is something that we've seen historically. It's been uh, quite consistent that a lot of the times the primary reason for homelessness is interpersonal and family issues. Um, we do so that was about half of the individuals reported that was the reason for homelessness, just under half uh, or 49% of respondents said also that housing and financial issues contributed uh, to their experience of homelessness. And a quarter of them uh, respondents had said that health and corrections did contribute to their experience of homelessness when the survey was completed as well. Um, I do just want to thank all the community partners that were part of this process uh, and all the individuals who were willing to answer the surveys. and. And it's, they're not always a very comfortable situation to be in when you're answering the survey and the questions that are put forth. It does help us to inform the service delivery and the work that we're doing. It also helps prioritize families for uh, services that do become available through programs such as our SHOP program. And as we move forward as coordinated access and the implementation of a coordinated access system, this by name list will be extremely important uh, to ensure that all uh, organizations that are working with individuals experiencing homelessness are pulling that data off of the same list and pulling families off that same list uh, to ensure that they're prioritized for service and we maximize the housing resources available to us across the community. Oh, you're on, you're on mute, Bonnie. Thank you. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? 
um, Councillor Burbach and then Councillor Bunting. Yes, thank you very much for the report. Um, I'm just like, taking a look at the infographic and it says health and corrections 25%. I'm wondering if you could um, define what that means. I was just wondering what, what exactly corrections meant. Of course, uh, through the chair, that would be discharge from institutions, uh, would be provincial institutions, which are classified as uh, corrections and hospital. Councillor Bunting? Yeah, just with respect to the, the number 164 uh, households, um, how many people would that be in total? I'm assuming that some would be couples or maybe a family of three or four. How many people are we looking at on that number? Or do you know? So I don't have the exact number. Generally, the by name list would speak to the head of households that were included. So there may be dependents as well, but I don't have the exact number in front of me. I apologize. Okay. Just curious. Thank you. Any other comments or questions? Um, Councillor Ingram? And it's nice to see you here. I know you're not on the committee, but I'm glad to see you have an interest. Thank you. I was actually invited by the director and the, and the police chief um, because of some emails that we've been exchanging. Um, so, so my questions are going to um, be questions that we all probably know the answers to, but I, I'd like everybody who is here watching to, to get these answers. Um, so when you do these surveys, um, how are they distributed and how do you, how do you perform that outreach? Through the chair, so are you speaking to the enumeration specifically or how these are done? Because we also use the enumeration or the VI SPDAT uh, and the by name list information that is done on a regular basis for all families that are added to our, to the by name list. Uh, so that is done through different organizations and different what we call uh, points of entry into the system or access points. Uh, so they're trained organizations who already work in the system when they have individuals or families that contact them, reach out for services or individuals or families that are already working with them. Uh, that do become homeless during that time or are experiencing homelessness, they complete uh, the by name list referral, which is generally a VI SPDAT as well as some additional demographic questions that we capture some information on. So that would be done with generally the uh, organization that's already primarily working with them. Uh, if there's individuals or families that uh, can't access to that, they could access through the social services department, can be done in person or over the phone. Uh, and then we also have an outreach team that does go out and complete some of these uh, surveys with individuals. So if someone's accessing emergency shelters through our local hotel, our outreach staff would go out, meet with them, and part of their intake into the hotel and part of that initial goal setting that we do in emergency shelter is completing this by nameless referral to ensure that they are prioritized for service. Thank you. And then um, as far as emergency shelters, are you able to say the number of emergency shelters that we use and um, where they are? I'm not sure if we can advertise exactly where they are, but at least we could provide the number. Uh, through the chair, so we have, we currently work with three separate uh, organizations that we are places that we use for emergency uh, motel or emergency stays through motel. Um, we can't, I wouldn't want to say the exact locations just for privacy purposes of the individuals who are staying there and for safety reasons at times as well. Um, but we do work with three separate organizations, but there is also uh, ShelterLink, which uh, provides emergency shelter for youth. And then we also have Optimism Places, everyone's aware, which provides uh, services for women who are experiencing domestic violence. Thank you. And I think a lot of the questions um, on social media have been re in relation to mental health issues and whether or not to engage police, how, how people in the public should be dealing with the mental health um, or people experiencing mental health issues when they see them and uh, are perhaps approached by them or they're witnessing some sort of event or, or um, some some circumstance how would you suggest people in the public deal with um, those types of circumstances um through the chair that's it's a difficult one because it's done on situational in kind of what someone's comfort level is with an individual if you ever i would always say if you ever feel your safety is being threatened uh you would want to contact police uh at that instance um but for the general part i'd say most of the individuals we have experiencing homelessness they're they don't mean harm sometimes there are mental health instances or someone could be experiencing a mental health crisis, they could be in a state of psychosis. There's so many different contributing factors. It's hard to, to comment on, on a single way to approach them. I think just keeping your safety in mind at all times, understanding that individuals are undergoing some, some pretty stressful circumstances and 
in stressful situations. And I think just keeping that in mind, but if your safety is ever in question, I would always encourage someone to call police immediately uh, if your safety is ever being threatened. But for the most part, it's just, I, I always say just approaching with kindness and treating them like humans. A lot of these, they are, at, at the end of the day, they're people and they just want someone to connect with them on a personal level and have those conversations with them. Um, and sometimes people are, if someone is experiencing psychosis, you wanna leave that for mental health professionals. You don't even, our outreach staff, they're not mental health professionals. They work in housing and homelessness and their goal is rehousing. They're not mental health clinicians by any means. Um, we have, you know, they're trained in de-escalation and lots of different, different things, trauma-informed care and in different instances of how you support. Um, but I would say just, just treating them like they're, like they're humans because they are and, and just connecting on that personal level. But if your safety is threatened, then make sure that you do contact police at that point. Thank you. Um, Kathy? Um, so I had sort of some technical questions around the, um, the uh, point in time count and the by name list. And what I'm, I'm trying to, so the 10 organizations that are involved in the point in time count are probably um, part of the organizations that are also um, feeding information in for the by name list, I'm assuming, but I'm assuming that more than those 10 organizations are able to actually um, uh, bring individual, like bring individuals to the attention of social services to, to go onto that by name list. Um, were, how frequently does someone show up in the point in time count who isn't currently captured in the by name list? And do you think that, um, I think what, you know, what we wanna do is we wanna use the by name list to be as accurate as possible. And it should obviously captures more people because it's a continual, um, in, a continual intake. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to actually imagine, is there, are, is there anyone we're missing um, in the point in time? Is there a reason why we're missing some people in the point in time count um, because of who's doing it? And is it possible that we're missing anyone even in our by name list in terms of outreach and organizations that are involved in the, um, or that are involved in the intake? Through the chair. So yes, we are missing people. I think there's no by name list that's perfect. And regardless of what we put in place, uh, I think this is the most accurate our by name list has been, um, seeing that we just did a, a pretty significant data clean when I look at the numbers of newly identified individuals experiencing homelessness each, num each month, uh, October is not significantly more than previous months. And we did a bit of a data clean leading up to it to ensure that the by name list that we, the update charts we sent out going into that month were the most accurate they could possibly be. So we started having organizations in August re-engage with individuals who were previously on their update list that have gone inactive. And inactive is three consecutive months with no contact. So we started in August having those organizations begin reaching out to previous individuals who they were connected with to start having those conversations at that point. And we took the months of August, September, October, and then finally when we did the point in time count, we used those months to make sure we were capturing as many individuals as we could. I think every by name list does miss some individuals because un unfortunately there are times or fortunate that individuals don't have to enter the system in any way, shape or form. They're able to connect with family, friends, they don't have to come to a social service agency. For access points, we have pretty good coverage when it comes to the justice system, mental health, uh, addiction, social services, housing and homelessness. Uh, we're constantly, we have uh, here on Perth Healthcare Alliance also attends our coordinated access meetings. So we have a fair coverage when it comes to uh, the agencies that are providing updates. Uh, but unfortunately, I think we're always gonna miss individuals. We're always trying to improve the by name list and the methods that we use and how the updates are sent and how the updates are collected. We're always trying to work with our agencies to make sure that it's that it works. We have conversations with those agencies and, and they're connecting with the individuals who are actually completing the surveys to make sure we're capturing as many individuals as we can. Um, so I think the methodology is, is fairly good. We're, we're doing a good job capturing a lot of what we're seeing. And I think this enumeration showed that we were, the surveys weren't completed with everyone because we simply cannot get a hold of everybody during those 10 days and the ministry was quite prescribed and the method we had to use. Um, but in total, the, it does capture and encapsulate a lot of the individuals who are experiencing homelessness currently in our community, but we will miss some individuals. And that's something built for Zero, the Service Collaborative does look at as well, is how to keep improving these, that what we use and these methods and these different tools that are being used across the country. 
Thank you. Chief Skinner, I hate to put you on the spot, but I just finished watching the four hour plus budget meeting and you did an excellent presentation. And I, because we have like what, 26 people in here that don't normally come to our meetings. And I'm sure most of them probably haven't watched the budget meeting yet. I'd like you to talk a bit about how you have mental health workers driving in the cars with you now and how you handle when you get a call from homeless, somebody that's homeless. If you would go well, on. Uh, not at all. Thank you, Chair. Thank you uh, for the opportunity. Uh, uh, back in uh, October of 2019, the Police Service Board, in uh, partnership with the Huron Perth Healthcare, Healthcare Alliance, uh, initiated a program called MCERT. That's the Mobile Crisis Rapid Response Team. And at that point, there was one uh, mental health crisis worker from the hospital that was uh, deployed uh, to the street to ride along with police officers and respond to um, situations where people were in crisis. And uh, that one individual uh, did an excellent job promoting the program and responding to calls and providing support to people uh, who were in crisis. But I don't think it should be a surprise to anybody on the call to uh, understand that one is not nearly enough. And so over the course of the past two years, we've been able to expand that program to five uh, 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 mental health crisis workers that are riding along with police officers in Huron County, Perth County, and the city of Stratford, and providing support to, uh, to people in crisis and families who are dealing with loved ones who are in crisis. Uh, and they're dealing with them on the street, in their homes, uh, instead of in hospital. Uh, which has significantly uh, better results uh, when you're dealing people dealing with people outside an institutional setting. When uh, and of course, the uh, crisis workers are are well trained in in uh, uh, mental health and they're trained in uh, de-escalation and crisis intervention, uh, as are the police officers. Uh, but uh, police officers are not subject matter experts in providing care to. Uh, uh, people who are in mental health crisis. Uh, so that partnership has been instrumental in the success of dealing with people on the street uh, who are in crisis, providing them with the referrals and the support that they need. And, and also um, uh, in those situations where there needs to be uh, medical attention, the, the apprehension and the, and the uh, uh, legislative um, uh, a means to be able to apprehend somebody and take them for uh, a, a psych assessment and get support in the hospital is instrumental as well to the support or the uh, success of the program. So uh, when the police respond to a call for service involving a somebody who has is in mental health crisis or or is simply homeless, our role is not there. And I should say from the outset that uh, being homeless is not a crime. It's not a criminal offense. We don't arrest people for being homeless. Uh, if, if people see us respond to somebody who is in crisis or somebody who is uh, homeless and in need of support and they see them going into the back seat of a cruiser, for instance, it doesn't mean they're under arrest. It simply means that we, are, we may be transporting them someplace to a place of safety where they can get the support they need or they may be apprehended under the Mental Health Act to be taken to the hospital for assessment. We're not taking them to jail. And there seems to be this perception out there that when the police are called and they are uh, called to somebody in mental health crisis or uh, uh, suffering a, uh, an episode in relation to drug addiction or uh, uh, as a result of homelessness that we are taking them to incarcerate them. And that's not the case. We do not charge people in those situations. Uh, there are some situations where there are criminal offenses that uh, require some uh, enforcement of the law, but it, far and away, the vast majority of the calls for service that we attend to in relation to people in crisis, we're there to support and provide them with uh, the, the means to get the, the uh, um, uh, community support that they need. Thank you very much. I thought that was important for people to understand that the police are there to help. And um, I, I've seen it myself when I was there one time at City Hall and somebody was 
having a, a breakdown inside city hall and police came and talked to them and got them outside and you know they were kind and caring and you know it was nice to see that that's what happens because I was scared you know like when somebody's yelling and shouting you don't know what's going to happen you don't know we don't know from each other if somebody's on drugs or having a mental breakdown or maybe they just found out they had cancer or something or they had a family breakout you don't know what the emotion is right so and and these are emotionally charged situations that that can become uh unpredictable or volatile very quickly and it's not something that normally somebody maybe would have done but because they were in crisis um you know like it it's amazing how your body can go into shock or denial or something and you act different than normal. Kathy, did you have your hand up again? Go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to, to make more of a comment that um, a part of part of destigmatization of mental health and homelessness um, is the understanding that that a lot of the instances of mental health crises happen at homes to people that aren't homeless. And when we talk about violence, um, people who are experiencing homelessness and certainly people who are experiencing mental health crises are more likely to be the victims of violence than be violent themselves. And it's always, um, I just always wanna remind everyone that, that with the, when the police have someone who's a mental health worker who's there with them, that person is available for calls to people's houses as well, where a lot of these crises are, are occurring and require even a different level of intervention and understanding of domestic situations. So uh, I, we always seem to get drawn into this conversation when we're talking about homelessness, but I think we have to be a little careful not to always tie them together. Thank you, Kathy. That was a very, um, a great response to that and a reminder for us all that, you know, like, they say just one step, your plant shuts down, you run out of EI and you're on the street, right? Because not many people in this day and age have three and four months of money put away. They live pay to pay. Um, Quinn, do you have anything on this topic um, dealing with the parks and forest area of, of the city when, I mean, I don't know, do you get calls? Yeah, I'm, I was just here to, if there was any questions on, um, encampments or because a lot of these encampments um, are on properties that we manage um, natural areas parks sports facilities we have a um, so if there was any specific questions on when we clean them up or how we clean them up or uh, how we how we get involved that was more my role here but um, when we do have these encampments in our properties or we get called by citizens um, we deal strictly with uh, with social services. We don't we don't go in and start cleaning things up. We wait. Um, we call them to let them know where they are. Usually, they are already involved, and um, once they they've dealt with the individuals, um, then we'll go in and we'll we'll clean things up. Um, first, we go in and make sure things are safe. We eradicate the area of any kind of needles or anything like that, and then uh, and then we bring staff in to to clean up the encampments. Now, is there, like we probably all saw what happened in Toronto, is there a chance for the people to come and get their stuff? Um, a lot of times what they, by the time we get there, they've taken what they what they want. A lot of this is just what's, what's left of the, the area. Um, sometimes they've already been gone for, for some time at this point before we go in. Um, <clears throat> that might be another a question for, um, someone else about if they bring them back to get the the anything of value of value to them um, but by the time we get there I think everything is more uh, refuge than um, anything of much value thank you does anybody have any other questions now I had one more I had sent in I, I was just curious and I'm just it's just because I always like to look at things like that but there was like 164 identified and there was 118 respondents. But when I look at the gender identity, it only shows 114. Is that because some might be couples or something? I'm just 
wondering about that. Uh, through the chair, the, the op there is an option to decline to answer any of the questions on the survey. So those four would have been uh, individuals declining to answer that question. Okay. And then, oh, just not going to find my other question. Um, the 11% that were unsheltered, are they people that have been moving from place to place to sleep because of issues or have chosen to stay outdoors? You know how uh, sometimes people have been in and destroying places, they've got moved from different places and nobody will let them come in anymore, right? So through through the chair, that would be individual circumstances for each case. Some may have some form of service restrictions that uh, make it so they're unable to access hotels. Very few times do individuals uh, choose to stay outside or choose to avoid moving into housing. Um, there are times that there are service restrictions. There are there are times where individuals may not be from uh, from the community. There, there's various uh, circumstances that could apply in that. So I couldn't really answer the specific of those questions and also the privacy impacts of answering what's related to the number of individuals that there may be identifiable information with each and due to the volume of, of the individuals. Thank you. So I've seen no other questions. I see we have one person, Ken Wood would like to uh, ask a question. So I'd like to make a motion. Oh, I guess I can't make a motion. So we have a motion from the floor. Um, Councilor Ritzmas moving that Ken Wood can um, address um, the committee. All in favor? City Clerk, can you move Ken in, please? Uh, through the chair, we have permitted Mr. Wood to talk. Uh, Mr. Wood, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you very much. I have a specific question um, for the chief. Um, and then, a, and then a, a comment and a concern. I'm wondering, I've noticed lately that some of the banks have locked their outer doors, um, such as CIBC and uh, TD and Royal. Uh, for some reason, DMO has not. And it used to be a, the case that people, when it was uh, this cold, I mean, we're 20, 25 below at times, um, they would take refuge in the, um, the inner, the outer vestibule of a bank. Um, has the, have the police um, ever been called to charge someone with trespassing for being in that kind of a situation? I guess I'd also include the laundromat downtown. There was uh, somebody who had posted on Facebook that um, he, had, he had a real problem and, and police came and uh, this is his side of the story. Police came and basically rousted him out. Um, so is this system actually looking at, I guess, any kind of criminal or potential criminal interaction as a piece of feedback into what's going on outside. Thanks, Ken, uh, through, uh, through the chair. Um, uh, first of all, the Trespass to Property Act is not a criminal offense. Uh, the Trespass to Property Act is a piece of provincial legislation. It does have arrest authorities within the act um, so what, uh, generally speaking, uh, our officers will do is respond to complaints. And uh, if there is a situation where somebody is trespassing on property they're not supposed to be at, they will be served with a trespass notice as the first line of, of defense in an attempt to uh, uh, make the person aware that they are unwanted there um, by the property owner or an agent on behalf of the property owner. Uh, and it will be an opportunity in the future should the, the, uh, uh, the individual continue to, to uh, uh, violate that trespass order to be able to be charged with a Provincial Offences Act offence for uh, uh, trespassing or uh, be arrested and removed from the property if they refuse to, remote, uh, to leave. Um, very rarely in those types of situations do we have anything criminal to go on unless there is some type of behavior that happens, for example, uh, damage to property, which it would be uh, mischief and would be a criminal offense. With respect to the uh, vestibule, the bank vestibules, I know that uh, many uh, municipalities have been struggling with people that have been taking um, refuge from the from the cold or from the elements inside these uh, these areas and they are causing people who want to use those particular sites concern they uh, people feel unsafe going in there to withdraw money uh, and they uh, the uh, property owners have decided to uh, alleviate that 
uh, concern from their clientele by locking the doors. Um, that is certainly their option. Thank you very much for that answer. And uh, through the chair, um, a follow-up on that is, I can understand if private property owners um, perhaps don't have a high sense of, of morality or compassion, but from the point of view of city council and governments and elected representatives, we've got a really cold snap going on here. What is the city doing? And, and this is besides what's happening at, at St. Paul's, which was a great initiative. And I applaud uh, Councillor Ritzma for his involvement in that. Um, but that is only open limited hours. What is the city going to do immediately in the next while to open up warming centers? I realize that COVID is placing some restrictions on things, but the city has facilities all over the place that are heated. Um, is there something that's going to be done that's going to be basically allowing anybody who's homeless uh, to come in 24 seven at any time and at least be inside and get warm? and may perhaps have access to a washroom. I realize that would be a cost uh, to the city for staffing and such, but um, I do strongly, strongly believe that local governments and governments at all levels uh, have a duty to take care of their citizens. Uh, to me, that's the number one uh, duty of, a, of any government. And what is uh, my local city council doing in the immediate uh, to help shelter and keep people from having um, being out in the cold and having frostbite and possibly even dying. There's a lot of people that have died in Toronto because of this. Uh, and I'm very, very concerned. I'd really like to know what the plan is to handle the immediacy of the uh, cold outside. Thank you. Sam, would you like to respond to that? Through the chair, I'm gonna ask uh, Alex to speak to our cold weather policy process that we have implemented. Uh, through the chair so once our cold weather policy looks at the uh so what the temperature is sitting at so minus 10 with wind chill we try to engage with individuals so our outreach team would be out um, trying to connect with individuals to put them into emergency shelter spaces uh, sometimes there are service restrictions that uh, bar an individual from attending uh, an emergency shelter location but we do try to find alternative spaces for them to stay uh, at this point we do not have an out of the cold program of, of any form uh, but we are working towards trying to ensure everybody is sheltered uh, during the cold weather. I know there have been some individuals who uh, we have not been able to connect with to get into shelter over the past few days, but we continue to try to find some alternative options for them at this point. Thank you. Is that everything, Ken? Um, everything I can think of um, other than please speed this up, speed this up. Thank you. Thanks for your participation. <clears throat> so anything else on this topic? Seeing none, I'd like to thank everybody for um, all their work on this. And uh, um, I'm very proud of the fact that the city of Strawford did their homeless enumeration before the government, municipal government, um, provincial government, I mean, mandated it. And that we were one of 47 um, agencies across the whole Canada that got to participate in this program because we had done so much work. So that's great news. Pretty proud of our little city here. <laughs> I know it's hard when you see somebody out in the cold. Anyway, so, um, Councillor Burback. I was gonna move the 5.1. Thank you very much. So there's no more questions or comments on this. Um, all in favor? Thank you. So now we'll move on to 5.2, which is um, <clears throat> the coordinated response for those on shelter. Strafford staff recommendation that report titled coordinated response for those in shelter be received for information. And um, Kim, who would you like to have speak on this again? Thank you to the chair. Uh, Alex and I are going to do a presentation on this. So I'm just wondering if Alex can get up the uh, shared screen for me. Perfect. And uh, I'm can I get a thumbs up from the chair that uh, they can see? Perfect. That's yeah, working. Perfect. Okay. Perfect. Okay. So um, first of all, I want to thank Chief Skinner and Quinn Malak from Community Services for joining us for this presentation. As we know, the response to working with individuals who are unsheltered means that we need to work with multiple partners in hopes of transitioning people to permanent housing. 
Some of this presentation will be a review for those of you who are familiar with the 10 year housing and homelessness plan, as well as the community safety and well being plan. Uh, but there are some key processes that we wish to bring to the forefront in regards to the city's coordinated response for those that are unsheltered. So if we get the next slide, please, Alex. One of the fallouts of this pandemic is the increased numbers of unsheltered homelessness that we are seeing. This issue is not only gaining attention locally, it is at the forefront of every consolidated service manager across the province of Ontario. In the last two years, we were able to access social service relief funding from the province in order to help uh, support the growing numbers that we are seeing locally. Next slide. We have addressed this prior, the local definition of homelessness, but I want to bring it to the forefront again for this presentation. And this is what we're going to define as our, our uh, local definition. Homelessness describes the situation of an individual, family, or community without stable, safe, permanent, or appropriate housing, or the immediate prospect, means and ability to acquire it. It is the result of systemic or societal barriers, a lack of affordable and appropriate housing, the individual household's financial, mental, cognitive, behavioral, or physical challenges, and or racism and discrimination. Most people do not choose to be homeless, and the experience is generally negative, unpleasant, unhealthy, unsafe, stressful, and distressing. So that is our local definition for the context of this presentation. Next slide, please. There are four types of homelessness, and for the purpose of today, we are going to concentrate on the definition of unsheltered or absolutely homeless and living on the streets or in no place, no places not intended for human habitation, as this has been drawing attention as of late. We want to ensure the community uh, that this is at the forefront of our service delivery as a municipality. And I will now pass on to Alex to discuss what we are seeing locally. Thanks, Kim. So through the chair, uh, in Stratford, as it was mentioned, and, and as Ken also alluded to uh, recently, or just a few moments ago, uh, we have seen an increase in uh, urban encampments where individuals are residing within the downtown core of the city. Uh, we've also seen an increase in encampments on the uh, more remote areas of the community. Uh, that's throughout the county and in more areas on the outskirts of the city. Uh, so, and this is also in line with what we're seeing across Ontario with other service managers, is that we are seeing uh, a significant increase in the amount of individuals experiencing homelessness as the rise in housing prices and the lack of affordability oh. continues. Um, furthermore, in, in Stratford, we are seeing uh, that homelessness, uh, unsheltered homelessness is exacerbated by factors such as, uh, that was alluded to, untreated mental illness or individuals who are undergoing or in the midst of uh, a mental health crisis, uh, increased risk due to substance use, um, the lack of suitable housing options that are available to decrease affordability of private market housing. Uh, the, the pandemic has really put a hamper, I think we, we have discussed this in previous reports as well, that there's a, a much higher lack of informal housing options available. So room rentals, couch surfing, uh, as we've seen more uh, households uh, take their, their health to, to the forefront, we're seeing less options for individuals to access uh, those spaces with friends and family for short periods of time or longer periods of time. Uh, it's complex to navigate a lot of these systems and COVID has really exacerbated those issues. Uh, it's difficult to manage mental illness or, or substance use when you are sleeping rough. And sometimes that's the way an individual is trying to stay awake at night. Um, I know we've discussed this before, but I want to reiterate, it's very rare that someone does not want to be housed. Um, there are times that individuals may struggle with the, the societal rules around being housed and what is acceptable, how to uh, deal with your neighbors, conflict resolution, your guest management issues, uh, safety of your unit in the building. Um, but I think it's just an opportunity for us to highlight that support for individuals once they are housed are just as important as the housing options being available to ensure that these supports are, are adequate and that they match the needs of individuals. And just to touch on unsheltered homelessness a bit more, when we see a lot of the individuals sleeping rough, there are times there are service restrictions in place. Uh, and those are a very last resort that we, that we turn to when someone's service restricted. Generally, that is to make sure that other individuals accessing emergency shelter are safe, uh, that the individuals that we work with, the agencies we work with, that their, their staff are safe and our own staff are safe. Uh, and that generally in a housing focused shelter system like we're trying to push forth and like we're really working in, in at the moment, 
there are rules around accessing emergency shelter when it comes to expectations to resolve homelessness. Those expectations are individualized and personalized. Um, but just I just wanted to touch on that. When service restrictions are in place, it is generally due to the safety of the other individuals that are accessing those services as well. Uh, and then in Stratford, as we've heard, there are disruptive behaviors that can be caused uh, in the community that may be, may be seen as problematic. Um, there's vandalism, vandalism, excessive garbage, or, or human waste at times. Um, there's disruption to or trespassing on private property. And we have seen ur urban camping causing a disruption for businesses in the downtown core and public complaints that have come in from businesses or individuals regarding their safety or concerns about their property. And what is being done? So currently, um, the Social Services uh, Department, we operate a housing-focused emergency accommodations program uh, that is done in partnership with local motels. Uh, that is for individuals and families who are age 25 and over. Uh, ShelterLink provides emergency shelter services for youth in need, and uh, their definition of youth is ages 16 to 24. And as mentioned, Optimism in place does have services in place for uh, women who are experiencing domestic violence. Um, social services outreach staff do proactive street outreach on a regular basis. Um, so they are out connecting with individuals sleeping rough uh, multiple times per week, and that is all across the county as well. That is not just in Stratford. We also respond to uh, information that's provided to us by other city departments. Um, by citizens and by businesses when there's possible encampments or when there's individuals who are uh, living unsheltered and at their service. And that's not as a, as, that's to provide services and engage with those individuals and try to find alternate options for them. And recently to up those efforts and increase those efforts in the presence and the support available, uh, we have funded Choices for Change to deliver a housing focused street outreach program. Uh, and that program did get up and running in December and, and, and it's staffed currently. And that's in partnership with uh, the Stratford Connection Center as well. Um, further to that, um, we're seeing that encampments in the urban core require a complex response. Uh, we know that individuals uh, need to be supported that are that need to access these services, but we also need to ensure that the voices of concerned businesses and citizens are heard as well. Um, and co a coordinated response really speaks to the fact that there needs to be uh, system level coordination to ensure across all service providers in the homelessness system, whether that's mental health, addictions, housing and homelessness, uh, partnership with police, uh, crisis services. Uh, it's very important that everybody comes to that table and our coordinated access leadership team uh, continues to work on implementing that coordinated access system, but it also allows for a table where uh, we have several organizations to discuss uh, what's happening and how we can improve services that are available. Um, there's also a need for uh, connecting those individuals to services. And then once they are connected to services, uh, cleaning and maintenance of identified encampments to ensure that uh, those spaces are safe. And I think a big focus that we wanna ensure is not lost and this is homelessness prevention. So ensuring that individuals never become homeless in the first place, uh, to ensure that we have programs and support, whether they're financial programs, uh, whether they're programs that focus on uh, housing stability, so support for individuals who are currently housed. I think homelessness prevention sometimes is, is looked at as, uh, as a, as a response when it needs to really be the focus, because if we prevent individuals from becoming homeless in the first place, uh, it really helps to avoid any issues down the road with unsheltered homelessness itself. Um, and then with our coordinated response, this just touches on what I just discussed and kind of look at it more of a visual. Um, so it's a combination of a coordination and collaboration among service providers, uh, proactive outreach and ensuring there's a connection to services. Uh, once individuals are connected to services and no longer sleeping rough, ensuring that there's cleaning uh, of that site, that there's maintenance, uh, and that there is support available for those individuals to either keep them in emergency shelter or keep them housed. And as I mentioned, homelessness prevention, just to ensure that individuals don't ever enter the system. Uh, there needs to be a focus on all four of these quadrants to ensure a safe and suitable response is put in place. Uh, and that homelessness response and emergency shelter are really only one piece of this. Okay, so I think uh, the city of Stratford, we've been very fortunate to have strong collaborative uh, partnerships with the corporation, within the corporation and externally with our local agencies so that we can address this issue on a unified front and leverage each other's resources. So we've outlined uh, some of our key partners as we move towards uh, uh, coming towards functional homelessness. Next slide. And the role of social service department 
is to coordinate the support amongst the service providers for individuals sleeping rough. And this includes homelessness prevention and housing stability services, emergency accommodation program, proactive outreach of unsheltered individuals, provisions of basic needs and financial support. So I'll pass the next part back to Alex here. So this speaks to what our actual coordinated response is and how that coordinated response is done. So when it comes to coordination and collaboration, we do try to ensure that social services is the primary point of contact. Uh, the reason of which is because we do most of the proactive street outreach in the community. We also have very close ties to Choices for Change in their street outreach program to ensure that we can support prioritize service and ensure that there is an accurate response that is being done. We also try to map these encampments so we're aware of where they are, who the individuals are that are staying there, so that we can ensure there's regular frequent uh, contact that is made uh, between our outreach staff and those individuals to, if they can't access services for any particular reason, to ensure that we're still providing uh, as much support as we can, still working with them to resolve their homelessness. Uh, just because someone cannot access emergency shelter for any reason does not mean that we're not working to resolve their homelessness, uh, that we're not working to, to support them. Um, so once an individual uh, in a cabin or an individual sleeping rough is identified, uh, we ask that you contact the social services department um, and the number is listed there. Uh, we would just ask, ask that you advise that you're reporting an encampment, um, that you, city staff will take the information um, and it's listed there, location, address, physical description, uh, the individual or description of the, of the site itself. If they have photos, they can email those in. So it helps our staff kind of locate. I'm not asking individuals to go and take photos of any encampment you come across. If you have them in it, because it's a complex area to, to get to, we just ask that you kind of give us a heads up because we're going to ask as much information as we possibly can. If it is on private property, we have to cross through private property. We will ensure we connect with uh, and receive proper permission to so that we can access that encampment. Uh, and we do ask that other city departments, and in, in, uh, as Quinn alluded to earlier, and police are very good at notifying us of encampments or where they're at to ensure that we can appropriately respond and that services are put in place before anyone is moved along. And as I mentioned earlier, if you do feel there's an immediate safety concern or your safety is being threatened at any time, to please contact uh, staff or police or call 911. Um, what proactive outreach looks like is our outreach staff complete regular walkabouts of known encampment locations um, to connect with individuals who are currently unsheltered. So this, this involves our outreach staff going out, um, sometimes as simple as, as providing some basic needs for them, um, sometimes it's going out to work on some form of case plan with them. Uh, we try to provide cell phones in different ways for individuals to stay in contact with us when we do head out. Uh, the regularity of visits really depends. Um, that's a very individualized thing. We do individual case plans with all the individuals and families that we are supporting. Um, every individual has a case plan that's suited to their needs and what their abilities are and how we can help support them. Uh, it's also, I also wanna highlight that our services are voluntary. Um, not every individual who is experiencing homelessness wants to engage with outreach services and that is their right. Uh, they don't need to engage with social services staff. We do try to work and find an alternative agency who they may be comfortable working with just so we know that they're safe and that we can regularly stay in contact with them in case something like a housing offer or uh, an offer for service comes up in, in one of our programs. Um, and when an individual is unsheltered and the outreach team is made aware, they respond accordingly. So once we know where that individual is at, we will go out and connect with them, announce who we are, ensure that they are aware of who we are and why we're there and, and that we're there to provide support. Uh, when we're made aware of an encampment, uh, we respond within 72 hours. Uh, we always ensure there's, it's generally a much quicker than that. That's the, the time that we've given ourselves to ensure there's an adequate response. Generally, we're, we're out within a day or two. It also depends on where in the county that is. Uh, if that's in North Perth, or, or sometimes it may take us another day to get up there, just based on previous appointments that outreach staff have booked to ensure that they're not leaving the other clients they support uh, without support and ensuring that they also have that those appointments are maintained. Um, we map that location or we do contact choices for change outreach staff and, and have them attend. And, and that's newer as we move into transition to having this program uh, up and running and kind of working out what that's going to look like between the two agencies. Uh, and when they attend, they'll attempt to make contact with the individual. Uh, and if we're unsuccessful our first time, we do vary the time of day and day of week that we're attending just to ensure that we try to connect with that individual. Um, Further to that, we just want to, we provide a compassionate and caring response. So we always try to ensure basic needs are met. Um, so during colder weather, we would try to ensure they have uh, things like hats and mitts and, and, and gloves and, and different things. Uh, they have an appropriate winter coat. They know where places that they can go to warm up. 
Uh, we always review for emergency shelter. That's the first thing we would do with every individual, see if emergency accommodations are available. And then we would make referrals to partner agencies as well to ensure that appropriate supports are in place, that individuals are aware of the services that are available to them. And we try to support them with accessing those services if they want to. Uh, it's really focused on, on kind of what that individual wants to do. It's, it's really their choice. We can try to work with them as best we can, but at the end of the day, we would just want to make sure that they're aware of what's available and they can make choices to access those services if they would like. Uh, we work collaboratively with a lot of our community partners. We have a lot of great organizations in this community. Uh, and just because we might be the ones responding does not mean we're always the ones uh, following up. We would make referrals to partner agencies that we work very closely with, obviously with appropriate consent. Uh, and ensure that we're connecting with them. Um, our primary focus is really taking that housing first philosophy and looking at permanent accommodations. If we can find short-term accommodations, we always will, uh, but the end goal is always to work towards securing permanent housing for individuals. There's only one way to end homelessness, that's housing. Uh, there's only one way to end someone's experience of homelessness, and that's finding appropriate housing. And as I mentioned, having the appropriate supports in place once they're housed, so they can maintain that housing. Um, we want to pr protect and promote the well-being and safety of those unsheltered. Um, that's why we will not discuss kind of encampment locations. We can't always respond. Uh, if a member of the public calls it in, we can't always respond and, and tell them why, uh, how we responded, what we did when we responded. I just want to be really clear about that. Um, individuals who are unsheltered do have uh, privacy and confidentiality protecting their, them, so we're not going to share any information out. We always want to ensure that they're safe, so we may not always share locations. Uh, when it comes to things like emergency shelter, we don't always share out uh, those locations or where individuals are staying. But we also want to make sure that we uh, protect the safety of members of the public and also our, our own staff and agency staff. Um, it's very rare, but as we've discussed, there are individuals who could be a mental health crisis. Um, they could be uh, unhappy in that day. They could just be experiencing some, some significant trauma that makes it very difficult for them to engage with services. So we always prioritize safety of everyone involved ensure we don't put anyone in a situation that is unsafe. Uh, and when it comes to members of the public calling in, and we would always ask that you focus, keep your safety in mind. Um, if you're calling it in, I, that's kind of where, where it would end at that point. If you have ongoing uh, safety concerns, as mentioned, contact police. Otherwise, um, you can always call back and, and let us know that, you know, there's an individual still residing there, or you may have uh, seen a different individual, but we always want to know and get updates where we can. Uh, and then our staff will complete regular follow-ups, um, some of those are scheduled meetings. Sometimes they're just popping out to say hello, see how they are, make sure they're okay, um, see if there's anything they need, and then connect them to services at that point. Uh, but we'd always go to them and meet that individual where they are at. When it comes to the cleaning and maintenance piece, um, when it, we look at, so outreach staff, as mentioned, complete those regular check-ins. Uh, and it is a voluntary program. We can't impose any restrictions related to the cleanliness of uh, the encampment where someone is staying. Uh, we have those conversations and address safety concerns and clutter with those individuals where we can, um, but we can't always ensure that it's a completely safe space because we don't know what those individuals have at that location uh, or what, what things they may have with them or their personal belongings. And, and so we just want to make sure that safety is, again, uh, a priority in this. Um, outreach staff do provide those necessary supplies and referrals to individuals to ensure they can maintain an encampment in a safe and suitable manner. Um, and then how it works is once an encampment is no longer active, so once we've been connected with an individual, we've been able to support them with the transition to emergency accommodations, or we've been able to secure short-term accommodations or permanent housing, um, we would have a conversation with the individual about uh, any items that may have been left behind. So this, I think, alludes to the question earlier. Um, we would engage with those individuals. We would try to have them remove any of their belongings. Uh, we try to have them clean it up as best we can with support from our staff. Um, but there are times where things are going to be left behind uh, and those inactive encampments can be unsafe. So that is when we would reach out um, to the appropriate city department and ask for their support in cleaning up that encampment, uh, ensure that's cleaned up within an appropriate time frame. And I just want to highlight, and, and as Quinn mentioned, that the method of cleanup will always ensure the health and safety of all the staff that are involved. So first, if there's a clearing done of, of any needles or any potential sharps that may be there are safety concerns, then after that, uh, the staff would go in and do complete a full cleanup uh, of that encampment ensure that it is safe. The last piece I'll touch on is just homelessness prevention and the programs that we have available. If you ever are find yourself experiencing uh, rental arrears, energy arrears, please do reach out to the office, uh, extension 200 at the social services office, where be well you could contact to ask about programs that we have available. Uh, so we have financial assistance to stay in your home. So that's arrears, 
Um, sometimes, depending on situations, we have short-term housing allowances available for individuals. Um, there are some housing subsidy programs available through the housing division. Um, there is financial assistance available to obtain a home, so last month's rent, uh, moving and furniture expenses. Uh, again, these are uh, income tested programs. I do just want to remind of that, but if you ever have questions, please contact. We'd rather you reach out uh, and ask some questions to us so we can try to see if there are services available that we can support with, or if not, if there's agencies we could potentially make referrals to. We have case management support for individuals who are facing eviction. Uh, so those are our housing stability programs that are done by our outreach staff. Um, you'll see some of those, uh, those are also embedded in the programs like our SHOP program. I'd ensure that there's an appropriate level of support available for individuals who are housed uh, so that they can maintain their housing and stay housed. Uh, we can also support with referrals to mental health and addiction support to help you stay in your home uh, if that's required. Uh, and then referrals to community partners for things such as cleaning, hoarding, and housekeeping issues uh, to help with support. So those are th some of the things we offer through our outreach program. Uh, for individuals who are accessing our services and to ensure that individuals do stay housed because as I mentioned homelessness prevention is one of the most important parts of the system in its entirety. So the next step what I want to reiterate is this is a fluid situation that will require us to continue to work with all relevant stakeholders ensure that and ensure that we are trying to enhance service delivery where the need arises and address immediate concerns. Our goal continues to be to achieve functional zero homelessness in our community, and we continue to utilize a housing first approach and partner with agencies to look towards more permanent housing solutions for individuals uh, living on sheltered. So thank you, and uh, we're happy to take any questions. Any questions? Um, Councillor Burbach? Thank you. Yes, thank you, Kim, for the presentation and uh, very thorough, lots of information, and Alex, too. Thank you. Um, so I had a question about the uh, rapid response or rapid housing initiative that I think we applied for funding uh, twice. And I know the first time that we were unsuccessful, but I'm just wondering where that application stands. So um, my understanding is that we have applied for um, to create some supportive housing units um, and maybe Kim if you want to give a little explanation of that and then perhaps uh, an update. Yes uh, through the chair uh, unfortunately uh, we were not successful on the second go around uh, of rapid housing initiative uh, that would have seen 12 supportive housing um, units uh, built uh, and, but are hoping that we will see uh, funding from the government come forward for another round because we know how important it is. Thank you. Yeah, just to follow up, I, I think that's really important and I think it's an a, you've put together an excellent um, project. So hopefully we'll be able to, to pursue some funding for it. But um, I, I look forward to seeing that the support of housing coming forward because I think it's it's a real need in our community. Kathy? I had a question around, there's a supportive housing funding, and I know there's the capital component to it, but are, are they adding sort of operational dollars to that as well? Because it's not just about buildings, right? It's about availability of services and availability, you know, mental health support, supports and all that. And I'm just, I, I, I am a little concerned that, it, that it's flashy to build things, but then not have a long-term plan for funding the, the supports that are needed. So um, I'm, I, I, do, I don't know that I ever saw the details of the applications. Were they just capital or did they include operating dollars? Uh, through the chair, uh, Council Bastelon, because you're corrected, it was for capital. Uh, we, again, we would be looking at um, sourcing who would operationalize it and recognizing that that's an ongoing cost because uh, operational is expensive. The ones that we did before this though included operational costs, right? The ones where we did some in Mr. and St. Mary's? Through the chair, yes. Through through the shop program, it had capital and operational. And that was eight in Mr. and four in St. Mary's from what I remember. Yes. Um, is there any other questions from anybody? Kathy? Uh, not a question so much as a comment and appreciating that, you know, everything that staff have said today, you know, everyone from the chief to Alex to, uh, to Kim 
is I like to, I, I appreciate that um, it's a people first compassionate approach that recognizes the dignity of all people, whether they're you know sheltered or not. And so I think when we see in the news some of the more sort of um, aggressive approaches to dealing with people who are unsheltered or encampments and stuff, uh, I do appreciate the level of compassion that seems and, and the focus on the end goal of what we're trying to accomplish. And I know that it often doesn't seem, it's not, it's not enough and it's not there yet, but I, I do like that we're only gonna get there if we actually do it from the position that we're doing it now. So I just wanted to say thank you for all the reports in the background and for the continued focus on being compassionate um, in our interactions. Any other questions? I see Ken Wood has his hand up. Um, I'm assuming we'd have to make a motion again for that. Jody, you make the motion. So the motion is to hear Ken Wood. Um, all in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Ken, go ahead. Thank you very much. Um, first, uh, through the chair, I'd like to say that I really do appreciate and following on what Kathy's saying is the explanation of intent in that report you just gave. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of cities don't do that. And I think that really clarifies why we're doing this. And I really appreciate that. I think that shows the human compassionate side of us all. Um, I would, I'm simply wanting to point out to council and staff to have a look at Stratford Life uh, Facebook page. There's uh, almost 100 comments about homelessness and what can we do and stuff. And then a lot of people came up with some ideas, um, some of which I, I put in the other chat box. Um, like in um, the UK, they have a formal program called Sleeping in the Park and they provide them with, you know, proper, I guess, military style um, sleeping bags for people to sleep. In Barrie, they staff the uh, bus terminal um, as a warming space, which makes me think, I wonder if anybody ever uses the bus terminal, what we have in Stratford, where you can turn those heaters on for 20 minutes. Um, and whether that's that's something that would be okay, or we could say you're welcome to be in there and use it. That might be a real quick fix to this. Um, but I just wanted to point out that a lot of ordinary citizens are coming up with some really great ideas. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ken. Okay, so, um, so, when I get back to my agenda. So 5.2, we, I believe Jody, Jody moved this, right? Do we have a mover? Uh, through the chair, no, we do not at this time. Okay, Councillor Bacalossus is moving it. No more questions or comments. All in favor? Any opposed? Carried. Thank you. Now we're moving on to next committee meeting. It's Tuesday, February the 15th. Is there anything else anybody wanted to bring up? I just wanted to mention that um, I see Ryan Erb is in the audience here listening in. He's very good at attending social services meetings. And Ryan, did you have any comments you wanted to make about the Stratford connection and how it's going? Or, or is there somebody else that would like to speak on that? Because I heard, I was talking to somebody the other day and they said they're getting around 20 people a day. And I think since we have some people here, it would be nice to hear that how they have support there and how it's going. Okay, thank you uh, through the chair. Um, Ryan here, everybody. It's good to see so many people on the call today um, and appreciate the updates that have been coming through. Uh, everyone is working so, so hard and I'm just thankful for Kim and, and team, uh, Alex and everyone else uh, that is investing time and energy into trying to support people in our community and Chief Skinner as well. Um, certainly, uh, uh, someone from Choices for Change would do a better job at this point of providing you an update uh, because they're on the ground and, uh, and right there. But I, I can say that uh, we have seen quite a number of people utilizing the new service. We're, we're thankful. Um, there have been some fantastic uh, offers from the community to provide support. So, uh, you know, small and big things, whether it's uh, dropping off coats or hats and mittens and that sort of thing. Frankly, there's been an overwhelming amount of support in that way. Um, and Choices for Change continues to receive items, but I would encourage anyone 
to check in with them before they just assume that they need something uh, to ask what it is that they need today. Uh, a couple of days ago, they were looking for warm mitts uh, as opposed to coats and socks at the time, for example. Um, I can tell you that uh, the uh, renovations that we're looking forward to are, are hoping to begin sometime in February. Uh, that's where the, there will be showers installed um, and also laundry services and some storage on site. And so we, uh, I was just speaking with Catherine Hardman earlier today. Um, they, they have received quotes now. Um, and uh, while the cost is, you know, inevitably higher than you hope for, <laughs> uh, we will find a way to, to find the money for that from some generous donors and other sources uh, to make sure that that can move forward. Uh, so we're, we are seeing a, a number of people there. I think the greatest challenge, of course, is the COVID restrictions um, facing us when people have to wait in line to access the service right now due to the restrictions. So that breaks my heart a little bit when we try to open something up for the community, um, but everybody is doing their best and managing managing as well as they can. So um, lots of small victories recorded from, from Tanya Hefke, the, the coordinator in terms of people um, and their interactions with her, uh, the support that she's been able to provide. You know, I can't go into details again for privacy reasons, but um, but but I, I think there's been many small victories with with various individuals, uh, and we can we can uh, imagine that more things will continue to happen. Organizations, uh, community support members um, uh, are are certainly surrounding the project, um, and in new ways um, uh, each and every day. There are offers from professionals um, in the community to support and help. Um, you know, everything from People saying, "Hey, I could come and and, and uh, do haircuts," to uh, you know, uh, to other more formal services that are just you know, as the as the word spreads and understanding spreads of the of the of the particular program. So we're expecting that it will continue to to grow, and uh, and I know that uh, Kim and her team have lots of ideas for where that's going to go as well. Um, but we're thankful that we could be a partner in in helping that uh, project to come forward. And I appreciate the opportunity to share a little bit. Thanks, Ryan. We appreciate all that you do at the United Way too, and all the other community partners and how hard they're working. And it's amazing how fast word can spread when something is successful and healthy. That's wonderful. Um, Kim, did you want to add anything to it? Uh, through the chair, just we, we're grateful for, I keep saying it, I think I've said it 10 times, but we, we cannot do this alone. And we're very thankful for uh, our community partners, external and internal. And uh, so we thank them for their support and their guidance and their expertise and their areas of, uh, of, uh, of what they know and what, where they can help us out with. I think that's wonderful to hear not only is there support workers there, but now people are offering things like getting haircuts and things like that. It just, you know, our community is really amazing how they step up and help out. Has anybody else got any questions or comments? Well, then I guess- Bonnie, can I say one more thing? I'm sorry. Yes. Uh, uh, yes. Just, I, I think the community would be interested to know um, uh, in terms of fundraising, we are doing well uh, for the center. Um, many of you would know that we're trying to raise a substantial amount of money to provide uh, from the United Ways um, portion to, to work alongside city uh, funds um, and social service funds uh, to make sure that the operation is, is uh, in place for this year and going forward. Um, but I, I just wanted to, to say that we can still use uh, monetary donations as well, of course, um, to make sure that uh, the, uh, the center can be operated going forward. And we put a link on our website on the main page for people to make direct uh, designated donations to that program if they prefer. Um, they don't have to if they give to the United Way campaign, of course, a uh, portion of our total campaign is going to be going to operating that. But if they want to make sure the donation goes only for that program, they have the opportunity um, just by going to our website. So thanks for that opportunity. Oh, thanks for um, mentioning that. It's a great idea. Because um, do you know approximately what it's going to cost to say do the washrooms? Because some people, you know, I don't know, are like different times we've done projects and times certain people like to get involved in things like whether they, you know, when they built the um, splash pad, the construction people donated um, material and when we did the stop gap ramp in town, uh, the Village Association donated the wood and the high schools built them for us so that we were able to do them for free. And so I don't know if there's anything like that. 
Um, through the chair, I can answer the question um, in round figures. Uh, uh, quotes have come in uh, very recently. Um, uh, they are somewhere in the neighborhood of, uh, and Martin, don't, don't uh, fall off your chair here, but somewhere between 80 and $100,000. Um, we had anticipated that they were going to be lower than that based on uh, a basic quote that was provided by an architect in town. Um, but uh, uh, we'll find a way. <laughs> among all the stakeholders to, to make that happen. But people can contribute to the capital portion and they could offer to help uh, potentially through services, although it is through a tendered, um, tendered activity through Choices for Change that this uh, particular program is going forward. So that it would have to meet the standards of their procurement process. So if everybody in town gave say $3, we'd have enough money. <laughs> <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Martin, did you wanna say something? Yes, if I could, and thank you, uh, thank you for this, uh, Bonnie. You've done a great job of of welcoming the community into this this dialogue. Um, just just to take what Ryan has said with regards to the response, uh, with regards to donations to the uh, Stratford Connection, has been amazing to a point where I think it's really wise for people to know they should call ahead if they're making a donation. I, I mean a physical donation, if I may, uh, so that it is in the records, if I may provide a couple numbers that people can call uh, so that uh, they just don't land there with their donation and, uh, and, and, and it not being received. So, so I think they're trying to set up a, a particular day to receive items. So if I may, I'll uh, give a couple numbers. Uh, the first number is 519-271-6730. And the, uh, the next number, which is the cell uh, work number, and, and uh, I'll echo Ryan's uh, point, uh, Tanya Hefke is doing an amazing job. And the, and the cell number, the work cell number is 226-921-5233. Uh, 226-921-5235. And once again, the donations have been great. And sometimes I'm wondering if, if monetary donations are better uh, at this stage because then they can buy what they don't have enough of. Uh, so I just thought I'd provide that and, and echo the comments made earlier by uh, council members here. An amazing work by the team uh, at social services, uh, Stratford Police Services, just amazing in the partnership with United Way. So. Thank you very much for uh, for holding a, an, a, an exceptional meeting here today, Bonnie. Thank you. Well, it really warmed my heart to see that we had so many participants because, you know, you see comments on Facebook and you think, I wish they would just attend the meeting to find out what we're really doing. And I know it's hard. I know people don't always have the time, but I'm very grateful that, you know, we had over 20 people attend from our city, which is just wonderful news because they'll spread the word and and if nothing else, I'm sure people know where to get the information. So anyway, um, if there's any nothing else, um, I'll move, uh, let's see, I look for uh, a, a mover for adjournment. Councillor Bunting, all in favor? Any opposed? Carried.